Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, the math of you, D, 4, 0. Initiate part 1. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Lucas Brown. Lucas is the mind and mixologist behind the pop culture podcast, The Math of You. On The Math of You, Lucas invites guests onto the show to discuss the formative media of their youth. Aside from being a podcast filled with nostalgia, it is also fascinatingly insightful. We live in a time of human history where media of all kinds informs our lives, personalities, and identities. The Math of You treats that reality with both joy and respect. There's also personal drink recipes. Mine's called the Red Tornado. <laughs> Lucas, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. No problem, Rich. Thanks for having me on. That was really nice. <laughs> Before we begin, <laughs> I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Your podcast is nice. It's easy to write about. <laughs> oh, thanks. You're welcome. It's one of those things where I'm really happy to, I think, have found my my audience and have the warm kind of nostalgia where it's not any kind, anything gatekeepy. You get that flair of, oh, hey, I remember that thing too. But then occasionally you'll get a flair of someone who hasn't heard of the thing you're talking about. And then you get the flair of, oh, I went and checked out this thing you were talking about. It's really good. Yeah. And I get to go, yes, yes, it is. Isn't it fantastic? I was flipping through your backlog and uh, some stuff that I hadn't seen. And, and so you, you spent some time talking about The Secret of Rowan Inish. I love that movie. Yeah. That was with uh, my good friend, Megan Bob. And I was like, I had never seen it. I had seen like trailers for it and I walked past it in a video store yeah. and she was explaining it to me and it does sound like a fever dream. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, it's like uh, so many of the things I love all in one movie. Um, very surreal and awesome. So let's, let's dive in on that a little bit. Let's, let's, let's dive a little deeper. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but tell us a little bit more about who you are and, and what you do in the world. Okay. Well, I was originally raised in Canada. I spent maybe the first 20 years of my life uh, bouncing around different locations in Canada, thanks to my dad's job and other circumstances. Uh, and I moved more than once a year for my entire life oh, my uh, up goodness. until that point. So I was going to different schools. I was going to different cities. Uh, and when I was young, it was very easy for me to use media as a way to build rapport with people and to find commonality. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, when I moved to California, the first thing I did was went to the local game store, comic store, and said, who here is a gamer and will you let me run a game for you? Because <laughs> nobody wants to run the games. I was like, oh, I'll run. What do you guys play? We're like, uh, champions. And they're like, yeah, we can play that. And I'm like, great. It's like walking into a, a bar room and just spilling gold on the floor and just be like, who's interested? <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. Everyone wants to be in a game. Nobody wants to put in the work to set it up. So you're basically offering them like a perfect storm. I, that was that was my goal. It worked out well. I've been friends with those guys for decades. It's been great. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, in this case, it was just something as simple as hearing someone mention The Princess Bride in 10th grade and remembering, nice. oh, wait, I saw that movie once in grade four. And I remember some of the lines from it because I'm me. And so I was able to know what they were talking about and go, hey, that's the Princess Bride. I love that movie. Yes. And very in instantly, like in that way of school relationships, you know, proximity plus rapport equals, hey, you're my friend now. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, it's a thing. It's a shared experience, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we talk we talk about that, like, at least particularly in, in you know, before the internet, when you ran into somebody who knew something that you knew about in, in some vague, weird thing that you, some corner of fandom somewhere that you knew about, you were like, oh, we've had this shared experience, right? Mm -hmm. Or in, in gaming, when you, you know, you both run through the same module and, you know, face the same monsters and the same traps. And it's as if you were there together and you never were, you know? And that's yes. something to be said about that level of nostalgia that I think is kind of a really hardcore part of your show, which I love that part. Yeah, you can spot a veteran of the Tomb of Horrors by the scars they carry and the <laughs> long look in their eye. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, and it's and especially when you talk about, about, you know, how the change of how the internet has affected that kind of stuff. There's an analogy that I've heard used, and, you know, being a longtime lover of dogs, I appreciate this, is you talk about, uh, you know, kennel dogs and shelter dogs and, how, and the different ways in which they eat. And that 
Uh, a dog from a kennel is usually well looked after and has had, like, you know, decent attention and, uh, you know, all the food that it wants because, you know, they want those dogs to grow up big and strong. And so when you put food in front of a shelter dog, if he's hungry, he'll eat it. If he's not hungry, he'll maybe take a couple of bites and wander off. Right. Whereas a shelter dog has had, you know, potentially a life involving some scarcity and that dog will throw himself into that food and wolf it down as much as he can hold any time that food is put in front of him, whether right. he's hungry or not. And so I have used that analogy in a couple of ways, but the way it works in this particular context is like, if you're used to being drip fed information, then having suddenly all the information available to you, you kind of go to town on that information. Like, right. you know, I can remember being in high school or university and, you know, getting access to some aspects of the internet, like, for example, comics, which I'd only been tangentially involved in because I didn't have a local comic shop growing up. So I would only have, like, a, you know, three random unconnected issues of Thor, right. uh, an issue of Superwoman, and one right. Batman where, uh, you know, Captain uh, was it Captain Boomerang fought the Mirror Master and Harvey Bullock quotes Gunga Din a lot. And having to try and put together a working knowledge, I remember I used to go to a comic book store near my dad's work and go to the bargain bin because it was all I could afford. And I would buy the official handbook to the Marvel Universe, those ones that came wrapped in plastic with the binder holes already in them. Yeah, yeah. And I would use an old school binder and put them together and just re as, like read them repeatedly and compulsively as much as I could. Because yeah. to me, even though it was just like one sentence recaps of what happened in each of those comics, it was still information. I didn't have that information before. Yeah. And then... So when I got to the internet, and especially I remember this specifically in university, after the first X-Men movie came out, which was the first DVD I ever bought, I got a DVD player because my computer was in the shop and my dad heard it was in the shop and he called the shop and had them on his dime install a DVD player and a CD writer without my knowledge. Oh, and amazing. And so when I came back, there was then a parcel in the mail uh, that had uh, the... the um, the first X-Men movie and the replacement starring Keanu Reeves and John Favreau. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a very silly football movie. Um, but yeah, so it was like, and then the website, the X -Men, official X-Men movie website had some like timelines mm. and my X-Men knowledge was pretty, you know, scattershot at that point because I had the 90s cartoon and that was it. So I just started reading these and the la the Cyclops one ended with Cyclops merges with Apocalypse which had just happened in the comics. Yeah. And was A, a bad decision, and B, kind of awesome. And so I went, <laughs> I, have to, I have to find out what's happening. And yeah. so I found, like, a whole bunch of other websites and just started reading and probably damaged my GPA for that year. But because <laughs> right. I would just sit and just, like, all this knowledge was in front of me. So I would just sit in front of my computer. Uh, right. And I, I realized I was about to make a scroll, a scroll wheel gesture, and then there was no scroll wheel. So I'll press a button on the laptop on, to go down like this. Right. Yes, yes, next yes. page, next page. So, so this clearly fed into your creation because this is another question I want to ask you uh, for the math mm. of you, but it does not explain uh, <laughs> the personal drink recipes. Um, so oh, okay. there's clearly more to you than um, traveling uh, the world, apparently, because you're not in Canada anymore. You're in Australia, yeah? No, I've I've been in Australia, in Australia for uh, it'll be coming up on 16 years in February. Oh wow! So yeah, and uh, like I've lived here. As long as I've lived in any other country, i.e. Canada, and it, this is my home now. You know, I'm, I've got my longtime partner. I've got my sons here. Uh, you know, all literally all my adult work experience is here. So right. uh, this is my home now. But the mixology stuff came in be, just due to kind of a rolling confluence of circumstances. And it's funny because I'm now currently in my job at the moment, my day job, working with the guy who facilitated this. And I did mention it to him at one point. And he said, I take no responsibility for your alcoholism. <laughs> um, but no, what happened is that I was working at a call center uh, for an ISP here in Australia. And it was a big call center. And on Fridays, they would go around with uh, one of the IT trolleys. And they would basically get two cases of beer. And you could have a beer within the last, like, hour of your shift. You know, okay. it's a Friday. It's quiet. You know, oh, you can have a beer. It's fun. And at the time, I was not drinking beer. Because I was a heathen who had not tried good stuff. Uh, I, I was, you. I was, I was a callow youth. I appreciate this. Mm -hmm. um, and so they would do that. And I would be like, oh, that's nice that other people get to do that. I don't drink beer. And my first pitch was, well, can we bring in a bottle of wine? And they're like, no, that's pushing it. And I went, okay. Um, well, look, you know, me, I, uh, have been listening lots to this 
brand new video podcast on my brand new video iPod because again it was the aughts right uh, called Tiki Bar TV and they pr- and they have a recipe in every episode and I want to actually try some of these so would it be okay for me and say five of my friends to pitch in and buy some little bottles of alcohol and some mixers and make ourselves you know one mixed drink one cocktail and my boss who is now my boss now was extremely lax because he did not care. <laughs> so he went, yeah, sure. And I'm like, oh, look, well, oh, you know, we've each got some tiki mugs that we've ordered. Can we bring them in and use them? Yeah, fine. And uh, the thing about a tiki mug is it's ceramic, so you can't see what the level is and how often it's been topped up. Right. So, and the thing is, I look back on those days and those cocktails were bad. The ones we were making, like they were an alcohol delivery system. And that was all. Yeah. Because not because the recipes were bad. I still use some of those recipes, but because like I was making them with the basis ingredients I could find at a convenience store. <laughs> <Right>. Like <laughs> we couldn't find limes. So we we're using those like lime squeeze, those little green bottles you get right. for seafood, which horrible. Yeah. Don't do that ever. Right. But it became a thing where I would do that every Friday and it started to become passed around. Oh, Lucas gets to do this. And then other people wanted to be in too. I'm like, okay, well, you guys can put your money in. And eventually by that point, I had become a, a manager in that call center and I had my own team. Uh, but shortly before- Is there, there a, been- a correlation causation thing between your <laughs> mixology and the management? Or uh- uh, No, honestly, it should have been a lack of causality. <laughs> but uh, like I said, not a lot of people were paying attention. But part of the thing was, is that there were, shortly before I became a manager, there was a contest where they're like, oh, who can decorate their desk the best? And I went, oh, well, that's easy. I've, you know, I'm doing the tiki bar thing. I'll just bring in some of my stuff from home and I'll bring in all my mugs and I'll, you know, buy some like you know, Halloween costume grass skirt stuff and lays and like hang them along and just like make my desk into a tiki bar. Uh, I even like printed out A3 like leopard print and like cut it into shape okay. so that the entire top of it was was leopard print. Uh, and I won and I got myself a gift voucher, which was nice. But then I had all this stuff that I basically bought for the purpose. And yeah. so I transferred it over to one of the tables in our team area and started storing some of the the bar stuff there. And it became the Tiki Bar. And then I started to, with my newfound power, as I <laughs> steeple my fingers, uh, wow. I started I started to do a thing where it's like I would start work at 10 o'clock. And I would, before I went to work, I would stop off at Erskineville Station, which is between my station and work, walk to Dan Murphy's uh, liquor store, which is a massive kind of big box liquor store. And I would buy ingredients. I would buy, like, in this case, you know, I'm trying to think of one particular, oh, I'm making a tongue twister today. So I will buy, uh, you know, I will buy some cherry vodka and I will buy some aged tequila and I will buy some, it's been a while. Oh, and some, some amber rum and a little bit and a couple of things of coconut cream and some grenadine drops. And I'll, and I'll go to work and I'll work out how much that cost me. And I will say, all right, who's in for the tiki bar today and send out an email, an official email, if you can believe this. Uh, and I would get like, okay, 16 people are in. And I go, okay, total cost divided by 16. Uh, that's how much it is today. Wow. And that, that lasted for every Friday for 16 months. So this became, so you had a curiosity about this and you were watching a podcast, a video podcast. Yeah, which ended shortly after I started. Yeah. One thing led to another mm-hmm. and you just kind of kept up this hobby. So you've had this hobby for, I don't know, it sounds like 15 years. Plus. Yeah, something to that effect. Okay. And, and the nice thing was, and this is where, um, again, this was a completely secondary thing, but looking back, it may have seemed calculated, but it was just kind of, I was baffled at how it happened. But in doing that, there were always sort of tailings left over of anywhere from a quarter to a half of a bottle. And so I would take those home because you can't have booze sitting around a contact center. That's, you know, bad form. Not right, like that's having a tiki bar on a Friday. That's where, that's where the line <laughs> gets drawn. Yeah. So I would take these like tailings home and I found very quickly that the cabinet I was using to store my booze was filling up. So I started having people over and I would make cocktails for them at home and get practice in. And so what I got is that by the end of it, I was doing much more complicated things and much more interesting cocktails because I found very quickly what worked and what didn't. Right. You know, I I had like an old 1970s like Playboy book of cocktails that was leather bound and had a red ribbon that I'd gotten as a gift. Okay. And I was like, I would pick something at random and try it. And sometimes they would really suck. They were terrible. And sometimes they would, yeah, sometimes they would be amazing. Also like necessity is a mother of invention, right? So, I mean, you Mm -hmm. had what you had what you had. 
Exactly. And so you would just, what, does this work? Oh, no, this is horrifying. Let's not do that again. Right. Exactly. Or, and, or vice versa. Interesting. And, and I'm always someone, and the thing is, I mentioned this on my show a bunch. I'm someone who wants to know why something doesn't work. Especially because, especially if I've invested time and money and stuff. And I get a little disappointed when it doesn't work. So I'm like, hey, why did that, why was that bad? And then I start to tinker with it. And especially when it comes to bartending, you know, I started getting better books. I started doing more research. Um, I started getting like books from the 20s, books from the 40s right. of these classic cocktails and being like, you know, these prohibition era things. Why are they still around? Well, one, because they're good. But two is that they're versatile. Is that yeah. you can take something and be like, all right, I've got three of the four ingredients and I've got something similar to the fourth ingredient. Let's see how that changes it. And sometimes it changes it and you go, oh, that's really different and interesting. And sometimes you go, oh, no, that thing that is missing is really important. Why right. is that thing important? I might invest in getting some of that thing and then I'll use it in something else. That's See, this is the analysis part of it so you're not i mean you're not a professionally trained mixologist i know we're talking nope. a lot about this mixology part but we were talking before uh when i was on your show emily and i have both been on your show and loved it had a fantastic mm -hmm. time and recently i was also on another pad podcast called the secret seller yeah, and which i have listened to and jason it's a great podcast i love it yeah and Jason and I were discussing this concept of of creativity and combining the things that are that the not not necessarily the things that are uniquely you, but they're combined in you in unique ways, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this this experience traveling because you had to, right? Mm -hmm. You had this experience using utilizing or seeing the worth in formative media of childhood, how it forms personalities, and and of course traveling so much, you you I imagine you would see. Oh, the people who like Princess Bride are people I'm I'm actually drawn to for some reason mm. because of there's something that draws us both to it, right? Or yeah. the flip side, we were both like again formatively affected by Princess Bride as part of our personality or humor or whatever it happened to be. And then you've got this other thing with the mixology, which was just so interesting to me because I'm not a heavy drinker, mm. so I'm not much of a drinker at all. But like you were like, oh, okay, well let's do this drink thing, and I'm like. This is a fascinating combination of <laughs> of passions that is uniquely you and that you it, it's allowed you to create the math of you as something that is uniquely Lucas Brown and put it out there as a creative venue. Right. You, mm. And and the the popular culture part of it inspires the mixology. Right. You use Absolutely. it as the inspiration for something else as well and creating something that's uniquely you. Yeah. And I especially like because thing is, you know, from being a guest on the show. What I normally send to people as prep before the show is I ask them to choose a couple of topics that we can talk about. I ask them to pick their walk-up song because I think that's a really important thing. It kind of gives me an idea of their of their character. Uh, and I ask them to pick, you know, tell me a little bit about what you like to drink. You yeah. know, what do you like? What do you hate? Because the last thing I want is to make something for someone and have them go, oh, yeah, does that have vodka? I don't drink vodka. I don't like it. And right. I'm like... I don't, yeah, I don't want right. to waste time like that. Well, we were so, a little hard for you because Emily's underage. <laughs> Yo, first ever <laughs> underage uh, and, guest. And I don't drink that much. Yeah. So, so actually, in your case, because like some of the stuff you mentioned, it's very easy for me to go, all right, well, here's what you like. I can take that and make it one step further. Yeah. And I think my, my, my goal with some of these specialized drinks is to be like, all right, I want to give this person something that if they go to a bar and they have the occasion to order something that's fancy. Yeah. They can be like, you know, I have this thing I want to try and I reckon I'm going to like it. Yeah. Um, and like with, who was it? Uh, oh, yeah. With um, one of my guests, Lucy Harrison, she's like, I've only just started doing cocktails. And so what I did is I made a, a really simple cocktail called a gimlet, which is just gin mm -hmm. and uh, lime juice and simple syrup. And um, I'm blinking on the extra ingredient, but it's super, super, super simple. It's the most right. basic kind of cocktail you can have. It's literally just booze and citrus and sweetener it is the most dead standard. But I actually have this great book called, uh, called from the Everly Hotel in Melbourne, which is one of my favorite cocktail bars to go to. I go there anytime I'm in the city because it's the kind of place where they don't have a list. The bartender comes to your table and he goes, all right, what do you like? Uh, what kind of drinks do you like? Do you like this? Do you like that? Uh, do, do you, or what do you, not only do you, what do you like, what do you feel like tonight? Do you yeah. want something strong? Do you want something sweet? Uh, are you going out afterwards and you want to kind of get things started? Uh, and then he's like, okay, we've got, like, we've got some really nice raspberries today that I got. Uh, or, I've, you know, I've got this thing, I've got that. And they go away and they bring you something without a name. And it's like, here, 
based on what you've told me, this is what I've made you, this is what I think. And you try it, and it's either A, fantastic, which most of the time it is, or occasionally he comes back and he goes, okay, next round, what did you think of that one? Tell me. Mm. Uh, I liked it. It got a little bit sweet towards the end, and that was a little more than I was used to. Hmm. Okay, I'll be back. And he goes and he makes something else and he brings wow, you something else. I've never heard of this. And it's probably because I don't go out much. But uh wow, that's fascinating to me. And what a great idea. But it takes it takes so much work and in mm. intuition and understanding. So this is a thing that this is a thing that Emily does too, because Emily mm. Emily creates playlists yeah. for characters. Very good playlists. Yeah. Fantastic <laughs> playlists that she has that are inspired by characters she's either played or heard on actual play podcasts or, you know, radio plays or whatever she's listening to at the time. And she'll make this playlist. And I listen to this playlist and I'm just like, I don't know 90% of these songs and they're perfect, right? Mm -hmm. She's combining these ideas into each other, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a level of analysis and, and passion and understanding and intellectual understanding and intuition that goes into these things. And it's clearly part of who you are as a person because I have heard your podcast. Mm-hmm. And when I asked you to come on to the show, you wanted to talk about this creation of a living world, a world that exists, that feels mm-hmm. lived in when you get there. And I think a lot of this that you're talking about, you're traveling around the world and your 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 need to know what works and what doesn't work, your understanding of popular culture and story from that perspective all feeds into this. And and I do want to get to that, And but I, but I have a couple other questions for you. So, please. One, let's talk Young Justice for a minute. Like, as I remember, you've listened to our show from pretty early on, yeah? From Jump, yeah. From from very beginning? Yep. Oh, I think I came in on like episode three, but then of course it was early enough that I just went straight to episode one. Yeah, yeah. So you clearly knew Young Justice before you heard our podcast, right? So did you mm-hmm. did you see it on the original run? Did you watch it? No, on- because because what happened was, and this is something I talked about a little bit with Emily, was just that I had come to a lot, with the exception of Batman the Animated Series, which I watched because it was on in the mornings when I was in high school. Uh, and I would watch it while I was getting ready for school. I would watch Batman the Animated Series and Highlander the series because they were on uh, on separate channels back oh, to man. back. Man, Highlander, jeez. Yeah, right. and I had a TV in my room that plugged into the, to an aerial, and so I could flip between channels as I was kind of, you know, getting dressed and eating my breakfast and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, like I have fond memories of Hardak, the evil computer uh, that had the robot duplicates. Of yes, God, it's a Hardak. bad episode. And, uh, oh, you know, yeah. killer, Cro- killer croc being found underground because crocodiles live in caves underground, which no, they don't. I'm yes. sorry, Batman. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, kids finding a Batman in their basement and, and stuff like oh, that. I don't know yeah. why I'm remembering all the bad ones, but the thing is that show, that show ruled. And then what I found was that, uh, in some time in university, I was introduced to, you know, LimeWire and Kazaa and other kind of file sharing sites. And I started downloading, um, Batman Beyond episodes. And I got maybe uh, just shy of half of the episodes, and I would just watch them repeatedly because at the time I was very much spinning my tires waiting for uh, my uh, passports and stuff to be done to come over here. And so, so I would you just, were still in Canada at the time, yeah. And so I was would watch those Batman Beyond episodes. I don't know if you know this, but Batman Beyond's a really good show. <laughs> it's a good show, so good. That cyberpunk opening and everything. Um, and so that when I came to Australia and. I was, uh, you know, this is years later, I started to look up and find media that kind of I could binge all in one go because I had I had a bear of a commute and I had a brand new iPad that I had bought and I wanted to load it up with shows. So I started pirating cartoons because I was also in a job that I did not enjoy. And so I needed that escapism in the morning and on the way home. And in that same uh, time period, I went through all of Transformers Animated all of Transformers Prime, all of Justice League, all of Teen Titans, and then all of Young Justice. Yeah. So here's a question I had for you, because this came up on when I was on your show as well. Yeah. Talking about where this where your, you know, understanding or, or grasp of, of all the animated stuff came from. And I've talked to some other people that live overseas, Sophia Soda Strand, and it's just I don't because I live in the States and so much of this is pre production mm-hmm. stuff in the States. I don't understand, like, there's a lot of pir- there's a lot of pirating, there's a lot of picking up stuff from other places because you literally aren't, you ha- don't have the option to get it anywhere. 
Like this yeah. idea that I that like for example like Sherlock, I was watching Sherlock, and to find out like I would I would buy it, I would buy it on iTunes, it would pop up digitally. It's great. I'm watching it. I'm paying my money for the show. Yet it would come out in England six months or eight months digitally beforehand. Then it would come here, and I couldn't access the iTunes account for the UK to mm-hmm. be able to get the show. And I'm like, D- I'm going to watch it and I want to throw money at you and you're not letting me give the money to you. So I ended up, a friend of mine got it for me. And then when it came out, I ended up buying it because I, I'm kind of big on paying the people for the creations that they do. But if you can't allow people to do that, if you're yeah. literally getting in the way of people handing you money, that's a problem. And when you're overseas, and this is coming up maybe with the DC Universe situation as well, because they only have uh, a Canadian kind of version of the website and this and a version in the states and so Mm. it's really a bummer yeah and australia especially has only just kind of caught up to the streaming boom like in the last couple of years oh yeah we got our own we got our own netflix like yeah maybe three or four years ago before that you had to get a vpn and use us netflix and even now uh us netflix has a much broader uh catalog than netflix does here uh because we don't have hulu here uh, you can get things, for example, when Brooklyn Nine Nine goes to Hulu and comes off Netflix in the states, it becomes available here. There are weird content deals and stuff mm. where, and at, and at the time, uh, even like, for example, the price of digital downloads uh, is one and a half to two times the price of them in the states. So, for example, a song on iTunes costs you two dollars nineteen as a baseline. Mm. So compare that to everything else. So. For example, buying a season of something is, you know, twenty dollars. And at the time, that was an astronomical amount to spend on something that had, you know, let's say thirteen episodes in it. Yeah. Uh, thirteen half hour episodes. And even then they often didn't have the rights to the things that you wanted. So I mean, Australia is one of the most pirating nations on the planet for television because the reason they started uh, releasing Game of Thrones day and date and time, as it is in the States, is because like they were looking at piracy numbers and wondering why is no one coming at uh, you know twelve thirty at night to watch Game of Thrones on free to air TV, and the answer was they didn't want to stay up that late. And also, it was six months ago; everyone pirated it. Yeah, like you have you have TV production companies looking at piracy numbers to decide what uh, media to bring in and pay for. Yeah, yeah, that's that's not great. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and no, I'll, I'll actually, I'll give you a, give you a similar example. Um, I, I, by the way, I, now I am older and I very much, actually, it's funny. Uh, it's now too much of a hassle to pirate stuff. So I pay for things. Mm. And it's one of those things where it once it started to be easier to pay for things. Like the minute I got into comicsology and could get comics digitally. Yeah. It was a whole new world because rather than paying, you know, $28 for a trade of six issues or God forbid anywhere from nine to $11 for a floppy issue. Yeah. Uh, I could go online even with the exchange rate and pay if there's a sale like three or four dollars for an issue. Yeah. Or get complete runs. Like I got the entirety, all a million pages of Usagi Yojimbo Ugh. for um for I think it was something like thirty dollars. And like that's six hundred pages a trade. Yeah. I'm gonna be reading that till I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas no, if I, I went, it. it would be forty two dollars a book here, and that's the soft cover paperbacks. Yeah. Yeah, I am a big Usagi fan. We're getting a little off top. We're getting a little off topic because I could talk about Usagi. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, okay. So we may cut. We may cut that conversation about pirating and put it somewhere else. But like, so, so you had to see because of the access, because of lack of access to a lot of the stuff in Canada and in Australia. That's mm-hmm. where you ended up, you know, you pirated the stuff, you had long commutes, you did the things, right? Now it's a little bit different because there's a lot more, there's a lot better access to to yeah, the absolutely. material, right? But that's how you had to get introduced to it because there wasn't access to anything else. And so you, yeah, you I had to go and through, seek it out. Yeah. Yeah. You had to binge through. So you so not had to, but you, you got the opportunity to binge through all this stuff all at once because you weren't watching it yep. when it was being released because you couldn't. Mm-hmm. Exactly. As, as I just realized, uh, you know, you mentioned Sagi Jim, but I realized that's one of my examples for later. So <laughs> Excellent. We can talk about that later. Um, absolutely. But yeah, and this idea of seeking something out and watching it on my own also, and it's something we talked about on when you came on my show, that meant I was watching these things out of time and alone. 
So when later I was able to, for example, get on Twitter and rave about this great Young Justice show that I was seeing and see that there was a podcast for it, it was this great opening and it was like a dam had burst and I could talk about this thing that had been in my head ever since I had, you know, watched at the time uh, all one season of it until the second season came out. And then I watched all second season of it. And, uh, you know, I was watching those as they came out. Well, admittedly, pirating them as they came out. Sorry. Um, but this idea where it was like, I had all this knowledge of a thing, like, you know, talking, and that's one of the great things about my show is someone can come on, someone like um, Juliet Kahn can be like, I want to talk about Teen Titans and I can uncork all of these Teen Titan feelings mm-hmm. I have had since 2008. Yeah. And can just be like, oh, right, yes. Oh, so, Silky the Worm is so great. <laughs> and how can you resist this horrible little face? <laughs> nice. So, so you you got a chance to see all this stuff, and it sounds like you. There, there, there's the thing about binging versus watching it something when it gets released on a week to week basis, right? There's yeah. there's upsides and downsides to both. You get the anticipation, you get the you know the thinking about it process when you when you have to wait from week to week. But then you also get when you're binging it, you get to see everything and and the feelings, and you get a you get a view of how one thing it doesn't feel. If it's going to be jumpy or if something's going to be inconsistent, you're going to notice it in a way that you didn't notice it when you're not binging it, right? Absolutely. And do you yeah. feel like that affected your experience watching the show, something like Young Justice? Well, I think, and this is something because as part of this, I start, I basically just like when I was, you know, making dinner and stuff, I just put on from episode one and let it go. And I could see, like, now with the benefit of hindsight, I could see how sometimes, like, you know, it's that writing for the trade thing where it's like, these are great individual units of episodes. And it's only when you see them in in a line, like the way you guys do when you break them down, you see all the threads that are built in there. Yeah. But um, I was like, I actually looked up some of the the sort of commentary and reviews from sites like Comics Alliance, RIP, pouring one out, uh, where they were reviewing it week to week. And we're in some cases we're really struggling with the pacing, mm. and we're just being like, okay, I don't know why this is a focus. I don't know, you know, I'm this person has been introduced, but they're not given much yet. And I'm thinking, just just give it time, give it time, it'll happen. Um, and it's yeah, it's seeing it all in that one line. Actually, it was the same when I watched Lost. I went to a Civic Video and I would rent a disc of Lost from you know the one dollar weekly bin, and uh, uh, my partner at the time and I would watch it, and we'd watch three episodes in a night. And then I'd go back and see if I could get the next one. And then when I switched to watching Lost Week to Week, like the beginning of season three, I fell off and never went back. Yeah. Because once you have that experience of binging something and then having a thing where it's like you watch it in a week and then there's like a week of other life in between and then you watch it again, you go, oh, wait, wait, who was that again? Was it that guy? Oh, no, he was the guy from, oh, no, was he? I don't remember. And you start to get really frustrated if Mm. you're used to taking it in in one go. Yeah. And it, it does depend on the writing for the show too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, each episode of Young Justice is supposed to feel episodic in a way. it's an episode. Right. Hi, Catherine Van Arendonk. I'm talking directly to you in how TV is not an 11 hour movie and an episode needs to be an episode. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But there's also this long form storytelling aspect of what this through line Um I just I recently interviewed Greg and Brandon and and Phil Barassa, um, which aired a few weeks ago as of this air the airing of this episode, mm-hmm. and they were talking about that 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 concept of that meta plot or through line was invented way back with Hill Street Blues and and how that happened where you have an episode of something but there's stuff that carries on from uh, from week to week which was mind blowing at the time that Hill Street Blues did it and it's pr- yeah. it's not uncommon now but it's not nearly as common as I would expect it to be. You know, so, yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's, let's, so let's dive into the, the, the topic of choice here. All right. Which is creating a living world, creating a world that you're dropping someone in, like in media res, this world has existed, you know, it feels lived in is not as common as you would think. (laughs) It's not, you, it's actually more common to find situations where it doesn't work. Yeah. So, first of all, why this topic? Why this topic for you? You know, it's something that I was thinking about because 
uh, it hasn't aired yet. Um, but on my show, I am going into a massive project where I talk about Discworld, uh, the oh. long spanning Terry Pratchett series Fantastic of Discworld. Fantastic series. I love oh. Discworld. It's, it is like literally the fantasy series of my adulthood in the way that something like Robert Jordan or Catherine Kerr was of my adolescence. Yeah. And it's also incredibly smart and ex- incredibly broad and Sta- like we talked about stuff that holds up to uh, critical analysis. Holy crap, does that hold up to critical yeah, analysis? Yeah, absolutely. And there's something that Terry Pratchett said in one of his books. I think it's at the beginning of Nightwatch, and I've got the book to quote it. And the minute he said it, it made complete sense, and it made why something like you know the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie, where Oa was entirely you know platforms on a world. Uh, surrounded by CGI landscapes for people to have conversations. There was no breath to that world. There was no life yeah, to it. Exactly. It was just, it was a soundstage. And I was, it started me thinking about why does something work? And I'll read the quote right now. I brought up the art of Discworld for people not seeing the video. Uh, every day, maybe a hundred cows died for Ankh Morpork. So did a flock of sheep and a herd of pigs, and the gods alone knew how many ducks and chickens and geese. Flour, he'd heard it was 80 tons, and about the same of potatoes, and maybe 20 tons of herring. Every day, 40,000 eggs were laid for the city. Every day, hundreds, thousands of carts and boats and barges converged on the city with fish and honey and oysters and olives and eels and lobsters. And then think of the horses dragging this stuff, and the windmills, and the wool coming in, too. Every day, the cloth, the tobacco, the spices, the ore, the timber, the cheese, the coal, the fat, the tallow, the hay, every damn day. And it's this idea yeah. that even in a pseudo medieval slash Victorian setting, the amount of work it takes for a setting to exist, you know, it's that yes. uh, hurricane hitting a junkyard and assembling a jetliner yeah. situation. Right. You know, and if you're, and thing about Ankhmore Pork is over the, God, 30 odd Discworld books, Terry Pratchett builds that city into a place where you kind of feel like, and the thing is, there are maps of Ankh Morpork. I don't look at them because I feel they're anathema, where you feel like if you come out of the broken drum, you can turn right and you can follow the, the bridge with the four hippos along it until you get to Treacle Mine Road and there's a watch house there. And if you keep following it down, it leads into the posh end of Ankh versus Morpork. And then you get to where the Ramkins live and then you're quietly asked to leave by the guards who hang out in the area because that's the rich neighborhood. So it's this idea that you can follow it from place to place in a way that I can only compare to actual cities like New York. So so here's here's the thing that comes up when I have these conversations, particularly about role playing games and mm-hmm. and some other things. And and kind of it, it's really feeding into a little bit how we're developing worlds or how we're leading players to develop their world in descent into mm-hmm. midnight as well. And this is this idea of the first reaction I get when people think like, oh, Ankhmore Pork, which is the name of the main city in this world or wherever you want to set it, it's it's alive because he sat down and wrote out all of these details, right? And that's not true. <laughs> that's actually... I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm shaking my head so hard because it is right. completely not so that. So let's yeah. talk about this from a creative standpoint. There's a difference between like, okay, I've created this city or this world or whatever, and I'm writing all of these details out. and feeling like a living world are two different things. Yeah, I think there's three aspects to this. And this is, uh, listeners, I am a compulsive writer down of notes, and I have specifically not brought notes for this episode because I wanted this to be organic. But the only things that I wrote down is that the three the three eyes for creating a living world, okay? It needs inertia, it needs interconnectivity, and it needs indifference. And I will explain what I mean by uh-huh, those. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm so loving this. In- inertia... It needs continuity of motion. Things need to continue happening even when your player or your main character or your protagonists are not there. If your if your protagonists leave a place and come back, it shouldn't be the same place that they left. This is not a city in a Pokemon game. You know, right. there's always a mall in Vermilion City. No, you come back and if you've done something, then that area has changed. Or even, even better, if you haven't done anything that area is going to change because areas change all the time. Ask anyone who's lived in a neighborhood for 12 years and they tell you, oh, that used to be a convenience store and then it was a kosher sandwich shop and then it was a head shop where they sold bongs and now it's a sort of a bougie notebook store. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're remembering three layers of strata. And so there's a, I think I'm trying to remember it. There's a line from Robert Jordan where a guy's talking about hunting something and it's really stupid if you think that your quarry is going to uh, move when you move and wait when you wait. Yeah. 
because they they do not give a crap about what you're doing in relation to them. Right. So there's this idea where this inertia is that if something happens, it will continue to happen. And so if you arrive at a place when something is happening and come back, the thing's not going to still be happening. It will have happened and something else will come on. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to indifference, that's a high point. This is without main character interaction. This is what you talk about with your Ankh Morpork. There are a million stories in the Naked City, <laughs> and you are only one of them because everyone else is doing something. You know, it's they're not an NPC in a video game get, feeding you a line every time you walk past. Yeah. You know, oh, I hear the king is having a coronation tonight. X. Oh, I hear the king is having a coronation tonight. No. Yeah. You know, your, your guards, your uh, fishmongers, your fruit sellers, they have rich inner lives. Right. So when you have these people, they are their own story, which briefly interconnects with your own. Yes. It's like real life. Go figure. And when you have interconnectivity, this is where I get, you get really interesting with Young Justice, because I watched a little bit to kind of refresh my memory, because it had been a little while. You know, in, I think it's the third episode. No, sorry, uh, fourth. Um, Drop Zone. Drop Zone, yep. Yeah, where they go on their recon mission and they arrive on the island and what they find is that Bane had set up a Venom factory there and a little fiefdom and then that had been taken over by Cobra at the request of the Light and then Bane was involved in an ongoing kind of coup to take it back over. Yes. And the team walks into the middle of that. Yes. And Great chaos example. ensues. Yeah. Because when they, because they hear like it, what we see at the beginning of that episode is Bane's captured, and mm-hmm. then he fights who becomes Mammoth, right, and mm-hmm. loses, and you're like, oh, okay, well he's captured or whatever. But the next scene, which is post credits, he's he's freed himself, and now he's mm-hmm. got rebels and he's got his stuffs going on, and they're like, oh look, there's two groups of people coming at each other, and oh now they're firing at each other. What's happening? All of that is this inertia you're talking about, and this. This is this is this also tying to what you're talking about? This indifference thing, where like the world is happening yeah. whether you're there or not. Exactly, and it's also that interconnectivity, which is that you know you get Robin who's dealt with Cobra in the past, right, and, and definitely dealt with Bane, and this idea that oh yeah, these are uh, characters with history that are connected to the world. And the show doesn't actually need to take the time to explain that to you because some of the characters wouldn't know that. Yeah. It's just like, this is a thing that's happening. And if you do have that context, then great. Uh, <laughs> to quote Chris Sims, that's, that's Cobra. He's the most dangerous man in the world because he wants to take over the world. Um, and it's one of those things where this would be happening without the team turning up. The team changes things as they arrive in that, you know, Bane briefly joins them. Uh, and just quietly, Danny Trejo as Bane inspired casting choice yeah yeah for sure Absolutely. finally we actually have a latinx bane yeah. um and he's a, he's clearly a schemer and a mastermind he's not dumb muscle no absolutely which is what he should always be yeah exactly that was always his thing that people forget that but and this idea that in doing that they are not also they are not you know walking into a scene that is a play acted revolution that they can then fix Bane has his own schemes. Bane has his own plot yeah. that he then incorporates the team into. Yeah. They are affected as well as affecting. That's the interconnectivity. Absolutely. Again. And then uh, you may wanted to talk about this, but I want to – so, so far you've talked about this, uh, the the inertia, and you've mm-hmm. touched on this uh, indifference. Is that what – that was one of the eyes? Yeah. What's the, yeah. what's the other one? Interconnect and interconnectivity. So you've touched on yeah. a little bit of all three, but I want to I want to talk just for a second before I let you dive into more of that about just the opening, the first episode, yeah. right? The moment, not I mean, the, you get all these kind of these opening fight scenes that introduce the characters. That's not that that's cool. It, it happens in other shows, but for me, this in media res living world thing was made clear when. Robin and, and Kid Flash and Aqualad were in in the Hall of Justice and they're considering mm-hmm. going on this mission and you find out so much stuff. You know Robin's been doing stuff for a long time and he and Kid Flash have known each other for a long time and they've kind of known of Aqualad, but they clearly have never worked together, the three of them ever before. This is the first time, but it seems like Aqualad is kind of on the periphery, like they, you know what I mean? Like where Wally and Dick are <laughs> best friends. He's the foreign exchange student. Kind of, yeah. I mean, almost literally to the surface anyway. And so you get this feeling of like, 
every every scene and every moment makes you feel like you're poking your head into a world that's been moving for a while. Even I, I'll even take it back further than that. I mean, you can look at the and thing is, I'm a massive proponent in the fight action and choreography of your fights tells your story. Oh, and tells absolutely, you about your yeah, yeah, for sure, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I I have described fights in Avatar: The Last Airbender over literally four pages of single page notes, yeah, be, single space notes because it's so important. And so when you see the team fighting a bunch of ice villains, yep, right, which is is a contrivance which just comes up later, and it's you get to see how each member of the team approaches the fight differently with the same set of obstacles. Yep. And that, and all, and in addition to that, talking about that living world thing, every one of these villains has a story. Every one of these villains has a backstory with some of the heroes, but not all of the heroes. Yep. And like, you know, um, I'm blanking. Remind me who fights Mr. Freeze. Cause it's not Robin. It's no, Mr. Freeze is Robin. It's the, oh, it's, it's, the, fir- it's the first fight. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Okay. Cause yeah, you, you get this idea where, okay, you've got someone with history, but then you've also got some others where it's like, what are you even doing here? Right. You know, and so. It's this idea where not everything is about these protagonists in these scenarios. Conclude part one, part two, T minus seven days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening and stay whelmed.